so we are good and live on Facebook. Welcome to everyone on Facebook, and I will give Laura just a moment to get situated, and then Deb, Laura, if it's okay with y'all in respect of time, um, we can go ahead and get rolling at least minimally with doing just general introductions and getting some folks into the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So welcome to everyone on behalf of the Southeastern School Behavioral Health Community and the Behavioral Alliance of South Carolina. Thank you all for joining us in today's webinar. And for those of you that are watching in the future, thank you so much for engaging with our BAST content. For those of you on Facebook, thank you so much for streaming in with us today. We are grateful to have with us Dr. Deborah Ham, as well as Laura Jones, who are going to be presenting an incredible webinar for us today. And what I want to do initially is just take care of a little bit of housekeeping, and then I will turn that on over to Deb and Laura. So if you all are joining us today and you take our pre-survey and our post-survey, we would love for you to connect with BASC at mailbox.sc.edu in order to get your continuing education credits. If you are joining us in the future and are watching this on an archived piece of uh, our website or YouTube platform, please know that you can reach out to BASC at any point in time if you have any questions or would like to connect with our fantastic speakers today. Um, for brief introduction, we've got Dr. Deborah Hamm with us here today, as well as Laura Jones. Um, Dr. Hamm is a member of our Behavioral Alliance of South Carolina, is a consultant for BASC, and we're very grateful to have her on the team and to have her expertise here with us today. What I'm going to do is go ahead and populate our pre-survey. While doing that, I will ask for Deb and Laura to share their screen, and maybe Deb, you can share a bit of an introduction um, for Laura, either now or during the rest of our presentation. If you have questions, please pop them in the chat below. If you have questions here, um, please put them in the comment box. Dr. Ham and Ms. Jones will have some time at the end of our presentations for Q&A. All right, so I will go ahead and turn it over to you both and say thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it is absolutely a pleasure to join you. As you said, I'm Debbie Ham, and I have had the privilege of being a public school educator for over 40 years. Um, I spent almost my entire uh, career in Richland School District too, where I wore, I think, every hat that there was to wear and ended uh, up my career there as their superintendent and retired and 30 days later went to Sumter as an interim superintendent and uh, finished up there and now I am really retired except for my work as a consultant but um, I still keep my finger in the education pot and I do want to say how much I admire all of you um, the absolutely heroic work that went into making sure that we emerged from the pandemic um, with kids still learning in schools and you've managed to get people fed and it's just remarkable turned on a dime to provide virtual education um, you are heroes in my book um, and i'm looking forward to talking to you today about um, taking care in tough times um, and I will be focusing sort of on how taking care of teachers, but also I hope that'll be an opportunity for you to do some things to uh, take care of yourselves as well. You ready for us to start? Here we go. <clears throat> I said this is teaching teacher. Oh, wait just a second. We got to pull up this and share our screen here. Uh, teachers taking care in tough times, and we're going to go on to the next slide, Laura. We're, co we're coordinating this together here. Now, I told you I was uh, I was retired from Richland School District Two. This is the picture of me and my four four of my beautiful grandchildren um, at the retirement party they had to for me, which was. Uh, groovy goodbye. And I picked this thinking about um, the fact it was so easy to be groovy and have a lot of fun at that point in time. And the pandemic has changed so much um, that a lot of people have 
lost their groove and it's time to get their grooves back. So that's what I hope we can help you with, with today that everybody can leave with some ideas for how to feel better and to help others feel better as well. Now, as a superintendent, I actually emphasize four areas. And I wanna just touch on those because I see this issue of feeling groovy as, as a piece of a whole. Um, in my book, education is really about four things and I call them the four squares, learning, character, community, and joy. Now the learning piece is pretty straightforward. We have schools so that kids can learn, um, but I also think it's really important and it fits with what we're doing today. We as educators and everybody in a school, um, it, we're learning, we're part of a learning organization. We are all learners to learning every day about how to do our work better, how to serve children better. So the learning square is for kids as well as adults. The second square is character. And character is part of the part of what we teach kids. Um, you know, academics is important, but it's equal important that we help children become fine citizens, good neighbors, good friends. And again, while the, we want to instill character in the kids, our own character is important as well. And it sort of good character is a gift that we give to one another, how we treat one another. Um, makes it part of, of the joy of being part of a school team. And um, character, um, as we exhibit it to kids, is one of the ways that they learn how they want to act. They're watching everything we do. And um, so how we act is really an important part of the curriculum as we're teaching character and as we're demonstrating it ourselves. So learning character, community is the last one. And again, it's got multiple pieces, but as public schools, obviously we serve the community. We need to be active in the community. The community supports us. But the other part of that is the thought of us being a community of a team in our schools and um, feeling like we are engaged with one another as community members. And then the last one is joy. So learning character, community, and joy. And we're gonna focus on joy today, but I think the important part, point I wanna make right now is that the happiness part of this, the joy part of this is not just something that's an add-on, it's an integral part of being effective educators and um, something that we need to, to experience daily in our work, work with kids. Next. So um, one of my favorite sayings is, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. And that's part of the joy that I hope that you feel as successful educators and that y'all help bring to your teachers and the other adults that you work with in your school. Um, if there's anybody right now, um, you're among, like I said, the heroes who are providing incredible services to children. You chose teaching because of that kind of service and joy should be part of the reward for doing that. Now, happiness is not just, our joy isn't just important because it makes us feel good. Happiness is a real um, advantage in teaching and learning. What we know from the research on happiness is that happy and healthy educators have a, have a pot, that characteristic has an effect on the happiness and health of children. In fact, ultimately on their academic achievement. This relationship between happiness and outcomes, I think is a really interesting one. When you look into the happiness research it, it turns out that they're kind of, it's kind of a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship. Um, often we think that people are happy because they've been successful, but the research shows that there's also this part that being happy is part of what makes you successful. And certainly happy educators are gonna help make kids be successful academically as well as socially and emotionally. 
So happiness is a nice thing to feel, but it's sort of our duty to work on that as a school system because it's, it's important for kids. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into happiness for a minute. Um, some of you may have heard of Sean Acor. He wrote a book, The Happiness Advantage. You may have seen his TED Talks. He says, first of all, happiness is a choice. Secondly, and I think this is important, happiness spreads. And finally, happiness is an advantage. And that's what we were just talking about. Um, I wanted to just mention uh, five of the things that he mentions, and he, he's got more than five, that we might want to think about as ways of feeling happy, improving our own happiness, or suggesting to others for improving theirs. The first one is called Three Gratitudes. Three Gratitudes is a habit of, on a daily basis, pausing and thinking about three things that you're grateful for in your day. Um, it's an easy thing to do. If you write them down, it's probably even better. But the fact of just taking time to be grateful improves your happiness. The second one is called the doubler. I think this one is an interesting one, but um, something nice happens to you. Uh, you experience some joy in your day. If you stop and take a moment to really think about that, it doubles the benefit of that happiness. That's the doubler effect. Um, another one is a fun 15, 15 minutes, just carve out 15 minutes purely for fun in your day. Sometimes when I think about teacher schedules and everything that's going on in schools, during the school day, it can be real hard to uh, find 15 minutes, but if you can find it during the day, that would be great timing. But if not, make sure you find it some other time. Um, conscious acts is fine, kindness when you do other to others. Um, but you would want to, done unto you, those acts of kindness make us happy. And finally, meditation. And I'm not going to talk much more about that, but we'll be coming back to that. <clears throat> We're waiting for a slide to come up here. It's okay. a little slow. Um, there are various areas of well being. And so as we start thinking about um, trying to, when we're trying to think about putting things together to really help people, um, we can think about it kind of systematically by considering these five areas of well being. Um, there's career well being that you should like what you do every day. And um, in that, I, I hope teachers can feel that. I hope you can feel that. Their social well being, that is, that you have good friendships, financial well being, physical well being, um, having the energy to get things done, and then community well being, which is liking where you live. But I also think about liking where you work, that is, as this community of educators all working together. But it's interesting that the research um, shows that actually. Career well being is really, really important because it does affect the other areas of well being to a certain extent. So, as we're thinking about our work as leaders in a school, as teachers, it's really important that we think about what can we do to make our career well being be the best it can be. And I hope that as we go through this workshop today, there'll be some tips that'll help you with that. Gonna, I'm going to share some uh, key findings from a RAND survey, and these things really have to do with information about the status sort of a well-being of teachers in the profession. RAND did a survey in 2021 um, looking into, into how teachers were feeling, and um, the news was not very good. Nearly one in four teachers said that they were likely to leave their jobs by the end of the 2021 school year, and Black African American teachers were particularly likely to leave. Um, more teachers were likely to leave, um, were likely pandemic leavers, that they were going to leave their job before the pandemic, but were more likely to leave 
as a consequence of the of the pandemic. So clearly we know that the pandemic is having an impact on teachers being dissatisfied with their work and leaving. Um, mode of instruction was a really high ranked stressor for teachers. And I'm sure that's a consequence of having to do remote instruction and sometimes going back and forth between school and remote instruction uh, or doing both at the same time. That was a real stressor for the teachers. One in three teachers, in addition to the things that were going on in their work, at school, had children that they were taking care of while they were teaching remotely, and many pandemic area teaching conditions like technical problems um, that were linked to the remote work that they were doing were leading to job stress, depressive um, symptoms, and burnout. So that was a national survey by the RAND Corporation. I thought it would be useful to take a little minute here and take a look at the South Carolina teacher surveys, which actually were a little bit different uh, and interesting. Um, the number one concern, if you look sort of, if this moves from the yellow being not important to the dark blue on the right being the, you know, extremely important, the most important. So you're seeing these things from left to right as less important to more important in terms of those colors. The, the, the highest ranked item here in terms of the survey fire requirements were that um, concerns about being effective in teach and reaching all students I'm responsible for teaching um, was one of the main reasons for departures from the teaching profession. And I, I think it's interesting. I was listening to a group of nurses um, talking about being in the nursing profession and their frustrations about not being able to do what they needed to do for teachers, for, for, student, for patients. And that's the reason that they were leaving. So clearly the impact of this pandemic and not feeling like you can do your job the way you should be able to do it and get the results you should be getting affects how teachers feel, but also how people feel in other professions. Um, lack of support from the local school board was the second highest ranked item. And um, my take on that is that's very likely because it has to do with a loss of control. That is, school boards were making decisions about maths, they were making decisions about other things, about um, you know, how they were going to, or how, how when you return to school, how that was going to go. Um, and those decisions that affected the classroom teachers were being made by the school board and may not have been the things that teachers saw, thought were in their best interest. And then the third one was lack of support from the broader community. And I think you've probably experienced all of you some of that in some respect. It's like, in some cases, I'll use um, mask again as the example. You know, you're, you're in trouble no matter what you do. There's some people, if you have a mask mandate, they think you were wonderful and if you, uh, don't have one, you know, you're in another whole mess of people are so divided on some of these issues that there's just no, no winning. And as a consequence, people feel the real lack of support from, from the community. So anyway, we know some survey information from our teachers and we know that teachers are, are leaving. So what are we going to do about that? And the first key point here is that and I'm sure every single one of you is doing some things to address those issues. You're doing some things and you may do, be doing them fairly regularly. But I think what's really important to keep in mind is if you really think that joy square is really important, then you need to have a systematic plan for doing this. It's not just piecemeal. It needs to be have a rationale to it. It needs to have a plan for it and it needs to happen regularly. And I'm sitting right next to um, my daughter, Laura Jones, who's one of the principals at Macmillan, Past and Smith, uh, an architecture firm. Some of you may be in Macmillan, Past and Smith schools as a matter of fact. And um, as I have been around her, I've learned about what Macmillan, Pass, and Smith does in the way of addressing the well-being 
of their staff. And I wanted her to share some of that with you. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce my daughter, Laura Jones. Well, I'm grateful to be here. Um, as my mom said, I am Laura Jones with Macmillan Hasden Smith. I am one of the principals here at the firm. Um, we are a nearly 300 person uh, architecture firm that is in seven offices across three states. I am have recently relocated from our Greenville office to our Columbia office to move back to my hometown. Um, but wellness is something that NPS thinks is really important um, at every level of the organization. Um, our program for wellness is called NPS Well. Um, and, you know, we are, um, while we are a large firm, we are also office-based and our offices range from 150 people to this small office that I'm in here where there's nine of us. Um, but we want to create a culture of health and wellness as an organization, um, whether that's promoting physical activity, the mental health support, um, belonging to the greater firm in our communities that our individual offices are in, as well as um, belonging amongst our teams and um, even within the work-life balance, as well as understand uh, wellness from a financial standpoint. Um, so this MPS Well was born out of this desire to um, create this culture of health and wellness at the leadership level, but also um, at the individual level through all levels of the organization. So our MPS Well program has four pillars um, and those are the areas that we focus on um, that include the physical wellness, um, purpose and belonging, which was a new one that we actually added as the school year started. Um, in some ways our firm MPS Well program sort of started a new year. So that's new since August with the purpose and belonging, mental and emotional, and then financial wellness. Um, each month, our programs vary, and there's a theme for the month. So December, this right now, is focusing on financial wellness. And at the beginning of every month, a uh, flyer goes out via email and is also posted on our internal um, social media platform, which we call Squiggle, which is our um, little logo. Um, little yellow squiggle mark. Um, and so there are various levels of how you can participate. There is the educational information activities, there are individual activities, there are firm wide activities. And then each of the local offices get tend to do the, also their own individual activities. So like this month, there was the virtual seminars on getting financially fit, which include, which are in partnership with, for us, Northwestern Mutual, who handles all of our insurance stuff and all of that, um, where they were doing webinars and seminars on um, preparing for retirement for those folks in our offices who are at that point in life. Or um, there was one about how to budget like a boss. You can see that one. Um, there was one that was for saving for college and welcoming a new baby. Um, so they're just trying to target all the different people in the different chapters of life, um, as well as what their needs may be. Last month, um, as part of November, our, it was really focused on purpose and belonging to go along with the gratefulness. Uh, you know, my mom was mentioning an attitude of gratitude um, was one of the things that we talked about last month. So you can sort of see in these examples how that played out. So for instance, the firm-wide activity was the firm had note cards little that looked almost uh that were branded on the front you can see one there that says mps making people smile and it was really just to send a quick little handwritten note to somebody in your office or somebody in one of the other offices who is making an impact or that you are appreciative of just as a little simple note of gratitude um our offices had you know this bingo game which over the course of the month you know go for a walk take a new friend out and take a new co-worker out to lunch or 
things like that to bring people together. And then, like I mentioned, we also do things individually as offices. So you can see here the MPS Charlotte team that did the Can Good Drive, and MPS Asheville team, which was putting together snack packs for their local school district for the kids that needed them over the Thanksgiving break. Um, so it's a really great way for people to be able to get involved as they want to be, but also stay out of it if they also don't want to, um, or it doesn't, they don't feel like it applies to them. But it really does focus on every aspect. We, you know, they encourage, the firm is encouraging us to spend time taking brain breaks, um, which in different offices look like different things. At this office here, we have bananagrams upstairs where you can walk by the file cabinet and on top of it, put your word in for the theme of the week uh, and just get time to sort of take a little break away from your desk to get up and walk. They say that walking is the, I mean, sitting at our desk is the new smoking. So what can we do to get up and be active? So um, I hope that you can take some of those ideas and think about how you might want to use them at your school. Um, sometimes taking a break is a little easier in private industry than it is in a classroom. But you know, squeezing some time out during the day is a good idea. Um, one thing I do want to say about squeezing out some time and taking a little bit of break, I do remember back when we started doing away with break rooms and teachers lounges because we felt like all that was was teachers sitting around chatting. Those relationships, those kinds of breaks are so critical. So if you're one of those who said, well, teachers can just take their free time and spend it in the classroom, you might want to think about a place that's more social than that and that you can really take a break. Um, and sitting next to somebody who is an architect, one of the things that I did that was interesting as we were designing a new district office in Richland School District too, is we actually designed a little quiet room. You know, if you've ever been to a spa and there's a quiet room, a little quiet room in the district office where when people were just majorly stressed and sometimes people got really awful phone calls, um, they could quietly go away for a few minutes and just take a breath. Take a breath. And, you know, even if it's a closet, you might be able to carve out a spot like that in a school. So um, attending to the care of yourself and to others. Now, um, I know most of you on this um, webinar may very well be leaders in your school. And one of the things that you'll be wanting to do is help other, others in your school um, with, with their own self-care regarding their wellness. And, um, Fortunately, and I'm sharing you, with you some information from the Iowa Department of Education. On this slide, you can see down there, I've actually put a link. And if you go to that link, um, the Iowa Department of Education on their website has a training program on self-care. So not only as I go through these slides rather quickly, may give you some ideas for taking good care of yourself and suggesting self-care for others, um, but I also want to just give you an overview of this because it's a terrific resource if you do want to do something with it in your school and could be part of that comprehensive plan that you heard Laura telling you about. Um, because again, I want to go back to this isn't a piecemeal thing. This is something of a plan and more systematic than that. And as I say that, I say it with some pain because I know you feel like you have more on your plate than you can possibly do, but I do think it pays off and it's an important thing to do. So um, the first area is psychological self-care. And there are some specific strategies that they go over in the training. First of all, practicing mindfulness. The second one, take some time and read a book, that's an easy thing to do. And you can read in short intervals, feel, fit that in to, to your daily or at least your weekly activities, learning a new skill and doing a digital detox. And that one, um, golly, that can be really hard for people. Um, but putting your phone aside, putting your, your computer aside, uh, people are addicted to those things in a way that it's difficult to do that. But Godly, not feeling like you have to be responding every minute of the day to what's popping up on your computer or on your phone is a really important thing for your own psychological well being. Now, I want to talk about mindfulness for just a minute um, and, and psychological self care. Two things. First of all, breathing. And 
um, I want you to do this with me. And you probably know that taking a deep breath can lower your stress, that it can actually lower your blood pressure. And it is something that you can do anywhere. You can do it sitting at a red light. Um, you can do it sitting at your computer. You can, you can uh, you know, take a moment, any place you are, and just simply take a deep breath. I do it a lot when I'm at a stoplight, to tell you the truth, when I'm in a car. So I want us just to do that for a minute. If you want to pose like this guy does, it's okay. But I think the most important thing, relax your shoulders. I hope you're doing that because it feels good. Relax your shoulders. Take a deep breath. And slowly. And you should feel your body relax. Do it one more time because it feels good. Deep breath. It is an amazingly healthy thing for you to do. And it should be, it's an easy part of your psychological self-care. Um, so the second thing is mindfulness that I want to mention. And for a minute, um, well, mindfulness is a type of meditation in which you focus on being intensely aware of what you're sensing and feeling at the moment. So I want to do that hypothetically with you thinking about a potato chip. That is an experience that I bet all of you have eating a potato chip. But let's take a close look at this potato chip. And if I want to be intensely aware of it, I see colors and texture. I think it has a very graceful shape. And um, if I can imagine eating that potato chip, I can taste the salt actually that's on the top of it, but not on the bottom of it. I can imagine the crunch as I bite into it. Might be able to imagine the change in the texture as I chew it up. And actually, if I chew it long enough, it's a you know it's a starch and it uh, carbohydrate, and it actually might, in addition to the saltiness, become a little bit sweet. And think about eating that one potato chip and thinking through all that in a mindful way, versus gobbling down a bag of potato chips because nobody can eat just one because it happens to be the side thing that's on your sandwich, and you as a teacher probably have three minutes to eat your lunch. Um, and it may or may not even include potato chips because that's probably not on the cafeteria menu. But anyway, that's an idea of mindfulness. And again, it it's a just taking a few minutes and savoring what it is. Like right now, I can look up and I can see outside the window in front of us a beautiful old, old tree. Taking a minute and being mindful of those things can really make a difference. So that's mindfulness. Both of those things are um, important for self-care for psycho psychological self-care. Now let's talk about professional self-care for a minute. Um, the first advice is to keep work time and personal time separate. Um, and I, for teachers in some ways, or it's, it's hard for lots of people to keep that separate, but lots of times teachers have homework that they have to do. They're grading papers, doing planning, et cetera. But to the extent that you can set aside times during the day, during the week, um, that you, you compartmentalize that and devote to something that you want to do or with your family, that's important. And not to let the uh, email on your phone detract from that because you think it's something for work. Um, compartmentalize those things to the extent that you can. Stay organized. I'll tell you what, I am an organized person. I make lists. There's a place for everything and everything in its place. I'm married to somebody who is absolutely not like that. Laura probably chuckled because she knows her dad. But it's like the beginning of the day is stressful almost every day because he doesn't put his keys in the same place. He's not organized about things like that. So the, you can reduce your stress by having your life more organized. Um, take breaks during the day. We've already talked about that, taking a little bit of time to step away from your work and evaluating your workload. And educators are compulsive do-gooders. And that's a wonderful thing about us. And, um, but sometimes it's okay to say, you know, my, my bucket's full. I'm sorry, I can't take that on right now. 
Um, sometimes you can get through a heavy workload by prioritizing things. I think sometimes we try to do everything with, you know, to get an A on our paper, where some things really need an A plus and other things, if you can pass with a D, they're really just fine. Uh, so you need to think through the kind of stress you put on yourself as a professional. Let's look at the next area. Click on, oh, we're waiting, okay. It went, it went, it went. I can't see it on my computer, but I can now see it um, on another screen. Okay, some physical self health, self-care, you're probably familiar with all of those things, but making sure you exercise, a healthy diet, a good night's sleep, reducing alcohol. I think reducing alcohol, particularly right now during the holidays where there are so many celebrations that involve alcohol, that's an important thing to keep in mind. I was just listening to some interesting things about um, people really feeling like if they go to certain events that they have to drink and um, some things that you can, you can do about that to, you know, remind yourself, you really don't have to join the crowd. Um, use those relax relaxation techniques, we said, like taking the deep breath, for example, uh, managing conflicts. Um, and one of the points that's in that, and I'm not going to read it out loud to you, is just give yourself the time to work things out. Sometimes conflicts work themselves just by the nature of giving something time, but there's nothing wrong when you're in a conflict. You say, listen, I need to step away from this for a minute and think it through, um, or let's both give ourselves a little bit of time to think through this and work through this. Um, so managing conflict and making time for friends and family. Uh, you know, it can be, you, I'm, I'm in a book club. This talks about book clubs. Um, I'm in a supper club group. Those kinds of links that you have are not only important for your physical health, but making time for friends and family is also, those, those relationships are also shown to really be one of the key contributors to longevity. So um, don't let yourself get so busy that you shut out your friends and family. Spiritual self-care is the next area. And, you know, we, we have our own individual beliefs and values that may help us decide about meditating and prayer. Um, but journaling can be really effective for some people. Going on a retreat, getting out into nature, um, you know, simply going outside sometimes and breathing some fresh air or appreciating the sunshine on your back. That being outside is seeing a blue sky. All, that is really a good thing for us spiritually and health-wise. Um, practicing gratitude, the attitude of gratitude. We already mentioned that. And then paying it forward, doing good deeds for others is very satisfying and helpful uh, for ourselves and part of our spiritual self-care. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about burnout. Um, I'm, you know, self-care can only go so far. And I think people who are experts on burnout would, would say um, that the stresses that we've been talking about that you can deal with, um, with self-care, ultimately can't add up. It becomes so extreme that you're burned out. And if you're burned out every day, feels like a bad day. Um, you feel like just nothing you do can make a difference. It seems like what you do is just a total waste of time and energy. You are absolutely exhausted all the time. It's hard to get yourself to do anything at all. Um, you feel like you're spending on the day with mindless tasks that you're not interested in and you're overwhelmed by them, but they don't make a difference. And finally, like, nothing you do is appreciated. Um, and so I think it'd be worthwhile to take just a minute and make some distinctions between stress and burnout. Um, maybe so you can do a little self-diagnosis if you need to do that, um, but also to think a little bit differently about how we might be able to help folks out that, that we work with. Um, stress is characterized by over-engagement. You're trying to do everything. And this time of the year, 
you know, we're trying to be ready for a holiday party maybe. Um, we're worried about getting our shopping done. We're worried about cooking. We're worried you know, about all kinds of things in addition to the normal workload. Um, stress results in loss of energy and um, it primarily takes a physical toll. Contrast that with burnout. So where stress was being overly engaged, people who are burned out will become disengaged. Um, stress, you have a loss of energy. Burnout, you have a loss of motivation. You just don't want to do it. And again, stress, you primarily have a physical toll on yourself. On the other hand, with burnout is really an emotional toll on you. And again, it's the burnout comes from accumulated and unchecked stress over a long period of time. You can have stress without burnout, but if you have burnout, you have stress. Now, there are a number of causes of burnout. There are work-related causes and lifestyle causes. And I want to talk more about the work-related causes because those are things, if you're a leader in your school, uh, you can have an impact on. The first one is feeling like you have little or no control over your work. Um, that, can, you know, often people feel like you do not hear them. And teachers feel often that they don't have a say in what happens in their work. So to the extent that you can be inclusive, that you can hear people's voices and act on them, they will start to feel like they have control over their work. So that's something you could do something about. The lack of recognition or reward for good work. Golly, there are a bazillion ways to do that. And my guess is that's one of the things that you do, but to do that regularly and make people feel like they get a pat on the back for the good work, thank you, gratitude, that is critical to release, relieving some of the stresses that cause burnout. Um, Uh, clear, overly demanding job expectations. You know, as I've talked to people who are working with teachers right now, they've tried to reduce some of those job expectations. Um, maybe they don't have to write lesson plans as elaborately as they once did. I know one person who said, we don't have to have, you know, a, a faculty meeting every Monday afternoon. I'm going to get some information to you by email and other means, and we're only going to have faculty meetings when we absolutely have to have them. Those things that can reduce job demands and give people a little more time, that's a real gift. Um, I don't think teachers do things that's monotonous and unchallenging every day is a challenge. And finally, working in a chaotic or high-pressure environment to the extent that you can introduce routine, regular communication, those kinds of things can start to reduce the pressure that people feel in their environment. On the lifestyle causes, you can share with people some of the things that they might cut back on, like trying to do too much, forgetting to work on those relationships that we talked about before, taking on more than they need to. You don't have to say yes to everything, repeating that again and to really work at making sure you get adequate sleep and use, um, you know, the, we know the things that contribute to good sleep, like going to bed at a regular time, not watching TV in bed, those kinds of things make a difference and having a routine and regarding your sleep that can help people get more sleep. So there are lifestyle causes that people can address as well. Now, the last thing I wanna spend a few minutes talking about is where we are right now in, in the school year. Um, it is the season. First of all, we have the winter holidays. And secondly, right around the corner is standardized testing. And those two things can be really major stressors. Um, first of all, be, um, actually, let's talk about the winter holidays for just a minute. You know, 
everybody thinks the holidays have to be a really, you know, you're supposed to have a happy, happy time. It's the ha happiest time of the year. But for a lot of people, it is not the half happiest time of the year. They may be alone. Uh, they may feel like they don't have the wherewithal to do the kind of holiday that they think they should have or give to their children. And I think particularly given COVID, there are lots of families that are experiencing um, of the loss of a loved one, their first holiday uh, without a mother or a brother or a sister or whatever it is. And we have to be really cognizant about those people and how they are feeling right now. Um, it's not something to be ignored. Um, it's fine to say, you know, I know this is gonna be a hard time for you, hard, a hard Christmas if it's Christmas, um, but I do want to wish you a Merry Christmas. And if there's anything at all that I can do for you, please let me know. I'm here for you or our school's here for you. Whatever you can say to them. That, so it's sort of a two-part thing. First of all, acknowledging the issue. And secondly, making sure that they hear that people are there for them. Um, so keeping in mind that issue that the holidays aren't happy for everybody is part one of this. The second thing though, in terms of the school year, and I'm gonna take us back to the South Carolina teacher survey findings, concerns about being effective and reaching all students I am responsible for. Man, does standardized testing, high stakes standardized testing make people feel like they better, they better do great on all that. There's a lot of pressure about the results of those test scores. Um, and in addition to that, because of the pandemic, there's a lot of expectation that, you know, learning loss that took place over more than a year is going to be made up for relatively quickly more and with more acceleration than it ever has before. And in many ways, those expectations, you know, it's nice to have a high bar, but are often very unrealistic. And so I think one of the messages that it's really important to say is to have high but realistic expectations, number one. To, and number two is to remind people constantly of all the work that they have done to help kids do well. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily gonna have the you know, incredible outcome that we would like to have, that we would close those gaps and my goodness, they're right back where they are supposed to be. But the teachers can feel success because of the work that they have done. And again, I started this by commending you on the amazing things that happened. Um, and teachers need to be able to feel good. They don't have to hook their success as an educator on the outcomes of these tests. And I do want to just, again, get people off the hook for feeling so concerned about whether or not they're effective with all their kids. People are going to do their best. They need to be commended for doing that. So those are the key points that I wanted to make. Um, here's this poor teacher who's worried to death about um, whether or not kids are going to learn all this stuff that they have to learn. And the fact of the matter is all you can do is your very best and celebrate the hard work that went into getting kids as far ahead and to learn as much as they can. And, and to know that recovery from a pandemic that is historic is going to be something that's going to take some time. Um, so we'll put the pedal to the metal and do the best that we can, but that's all that can be expected. Now, I do want to leave you with some words of encouragement. First of all, there is always, and I'm obviously Amanda Gorman is much more um, eloquent than I could possibly be. So I'm borrowing this from her. But there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. And if only we're brave enough to be it. If you're on this, in this webinar, you have braved a pandemic. You are still in education. You are brave enough to be it. And again, I commend you. Um, I salute you for all that you're doing. And then next, this time not in the words of Amanda Gorman, 
but actually this is from the great Oz. <laughs> you are cap more capable than you know. You're gonna do this, it's gonna be a great school year. And I absolutely wanna do the next thing and that is to wish you a happy holiday. You deserve it. Uh, most of you are looking at some time off. I wish you peace and joy and please make a time, make sure you make time in this holiday season to experience peace and joy and to share it with others. It's really been a pleasure to talk with you. And now I think there's an opportunity for questions and answers if you would like to talk to Laura or to me. Deb and Laura, on behalf of all of our participants today and our Facebook community, thank you so much, both of you, for such a compassionate and informative presentation. Um, also, I genuinely now desperately need a bag of potato chips. I don't think I've ever heard them described so beautifully and in such a calming way. Um, in our comments here, we've got uh, one of our participants saying, thank you both for such kind and inspiring words. It's definitely the mess. Thank you, Deb and Laura, phenomenal. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch our post survey and encourage our participants to engage in that and think about any additional questions that they may have. But uh, my hope was also to share that it was really wonderful, Laura, to hear how the work that we do in our schools is also reflected in uh, community partners and that other institutions and entities try and practice the same thoughts and practices around, around wellness. And I was curious um, if you could share a little bit about maybe what prompted um, y'all to engage in such a comprehensive plan. Well, it really started probably five years ago. And, you know, Architecture is an interesting profession um, because of the majority of our staff is under 40. Um, and you know, we really wanted to ensure that all of our team members, including our youngest ones and our um, more seasoned ones, were performing at their um, top level. And so it first started as what can we do to sort of, you know, we're a service organ, I mean, we're a service industry providing professional services. What can we do to, you know, give our team back, back something for out of really just wanting to support them. Um, and so, you know, as it has grown, um, it really has taken root, um, like I mentioned, at really a broad level across the firm, but also as individuals have begun to take ownership. I mean, I you know have just recently moved from the Greenville office. I mean, the Greenville office you can count on every Tuesday night at five thirty. There's going to be yoga in the conference room because a handful of people felt like that was really important um, to them and wanted to find like-minded people in the firm. One Friday a month in the afternoon at lunchtime, a whole group of cyclists take off in Greenville up the Swamp Rabbit Trail to Traveler's Rest to have pizza and a beer and then ride their bikes back. And that's just part of sort of the culture of each of these office of our offices. Um, every one of them is different. Um, but it, it was one of those things that it has proven to be so effective. Um, and I think part of that is probably because as it has grown, um, I mean, everything I was showing was, you know, it's branded, it is well presented. So it is something that is taken seriously as by our organization, um, but it truly is for the benefit of all of us um, from the financial piece of like sitting in there. I mean, I've got three kids, five and under, but what does it look like for me to need to save for their college? Um, you know, I, I, like the physical wellness where we teamed with, um, local gyms who offer a class a week for all of our team members to be able to go to. And that of course does something for us because it gets our team members doing something active, but it also, you know, a lot of those people ended up joining that gym because they found out how great it was. Um, so it's just, it's one of those things that it was, I don't want to say it happened by accident because it has been very purposeful, um, but it has all been rooted in the need to support all of our team members because ultimately 
They are the ones that are representing our organization and putting in the hard work. And we want them to be able to work and function personally and professionally at their highest level. Yeah, I've, I've sort of been a student of this issue of joy um, for a number of years and following and following it outside of the education community as well as in education. And um, it is increasingly a part of people's strategic planning or big picture of how they operate. It's um, people are realizing this link between happiness and productivity. And it would be nice, and people do want their folks to, you know, be well. And, uh, but, but a lot of it is just bottom line. Mm -hmm. If your employees aren't happy, they're not going to be good employees. They're not going to be productive. And um, so it's definitely the word joy comes up more and more and more if you start reading um, business literature. Absolutely. Which is, I think, is interesting. I think it's powerful to think about the, you know, we talk a lot in, in education about our culture and our climate. And in reality, we're, we're talking about what is the setting that we are implicitly and explicitly um, creating as leaders and as folks that are engaging to support that. And I think, Laura, it's really incredible to hear that y'all's leadership was really supported, that you had a culture of connectedness and you had a lot of buy-in. I imagine, um, Deb, that, that you know, this is reflective of ensuring that you've got voices and representation on those teams that are trying to say, what do we need? What is that going to look like? And it's incredibly encouraging to, to have these have what we are trying to implement in our schools being so successful in other settings um, such as Laura's. So I'm very appreciative and wanna just offer to the group again, any opportunities for uh, final questions, curiosities or feedback for Deb and Laura. I'm checking Facebook and it looks like we are good here. Um, we are very grateful to have you both here with us today. And Deb, as always, we are super grateful to have you as a consultant on our team and hope to continue to have that relationship with you and now with Laura ongoing as long as we can keep you. So well, I love the team. It's a privilege to be part of it. And it's, it's, I have enjoyed doing this. I've enjoyed doing it with Laura. So thanks, Laura. <laughs> It's really wonderful to have the mother daughter combo. I've got to say it's, it's, it's fantastic to, to just have that dynamic and see you both be very proud of each other and just speak so eloquently about something that's so very important. So with that being said, I will say, go engage in your self care for tonight. Take a mindful bite of a potato chip and a deep breath and go ahead and start frolicking in the peace and joy of the holidays or trying to make those connections that are going to help us to be able to navigate this time. So thank you both so very much. And uh, thank you for everybody joining our webinar today. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye now.